Last year, we shared a mini-series called Crypto for Institutions to cover the basics of the rapidly evolving ecosystem from an investor's perspective. Through conversations with Eric Peters at One River, Michael Sonnenschein from Grayscale, Seth Jins from CoinFund, and Ari Paul from BlockTower, we covered the case for Bitcoin, a path to access, investing beyond Bitcoin, and trading strategies. Over the next three weeks, we'll dive in a little deeper with Crypto for Institutions 2. This six-part miniseries explores where we are today in the rapidly evolving world of crypto and blockchains. We'll share conversations with the leading allocator to the space, four top managers, and a key service provider. The miniseries is strategic in nature, allowing us to learn without requiring technical lingo and expertise. For those interested in a more technical exploration, I'd encourage you to listen to Web3 with A16Z, Colossus's Web3 Breakdowns, and the Pump Podcast. Crypto for Institutions 2 is brought to you by Anchorage Digital. Anchorage Digital is the premier crypto partner for institutions. It offers custody, trading, financing, staking, governance, and the first federally chartered digital asset bank, all with unparalleled security. With support for a wide variety of digital assets, Anchorage is trusted by hedge funds, venture capital firms, banks, family offices, fintechs, treasuries, and asset managers. Learn more at anchorage.com slash cap. That's anchorage.com slash C-A-P. I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can join our mailing list and access premium content at CapitalAllocators.com. All opinions expressed by Ted and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of capital allocators or their firms. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of capital allocators or podcast guests may maintain positions and securities discussed on this podcast. My guest on the fifth episode of Crypto for Institutions 2 is Chris Dixon, a general partner at A16Z, where he leads crypto investing overseeing the largest pool in the space at $7 billion across four dedicated venture funds and a team of 80 professionals. Chris is one of the leading voices in the crypto ecosystem and topped the Forbes Midas list as the most successful venture capitalist in the world in 2021. He was a guest on the show last year, and that replay is available in the feed. Our conversation covers Chris's framework for Web3, network effects, venture economics, and institutional adoption. We turn to some of the areas he is most excited about deploying capital, including the creator economy, infrastructure, DeFi, gaming, and decentralized content creation. We close with how A16Z supports portfolio companies in crypto and Chris's thoughts on the current market downturn. I hope you enjoy the show. And if you do, this week, it's time to reach out to one of your siblings. When they ask you why you called, just say, I've been listening to this amazing podcast called Capital Allocators. At the end, the host always asks the guests what lesson from their parents is most stuck with them. And I thought, I wonder what you'd say. After they answer, respond as you see fit and then say, it's just incredible what I've learned from Capital Allocators. You should check it out. Thanks so much for spreading the word. Please enjoy my conversation with Chris Dixon in the fifth episode of Crypto for Institutions 2. Chris, great to see you. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me, Ted. There's a lot going on with the sell-off in the market. We can get to that, but I'd like to take a step back first. And you came on the show, it was a little over a year ago, and I looked at the transcript. There was no mention of Web3. So I'd love to hear your framework for thinking about Web3 compared to Web2, Web1. The way I think about it is there's core new tech that we're involved with, things like blockchains and tokens. There's movements on top, including what's called crypto, which I think of as overlapping, but a little bit different than Web3. And there's a Web3 movement. And the Web3 movement, the phrase has been around for a while. Actually, I wrote blog posts probably three, four years ago. 
referencing Web3, but it didn't really catch on until the last six to 12 months. The context is the internet, of course, goes back to 1969 with ARPANET, but the modern consumer internet really developed 1990, Tim Berners-Lee, Respect the World Wide Web. Mark Andreessen and a bunch of other people created Mosaic and that became Netscape. You had the browser that made the web much more accessible, graphical, et cetera. For those old enough to remember, the 90s was that big internet boom and people discovered how cool it was. I segment the web into three eras. So web one, I think of as roughly 1990, advent of the web to around 2005, web two, 2005 to 2020. And then I believe we're in the new wave, what we call web three. So Web1, think back to the 90s, it was an amazing thing that you could go to Google or some other website and type a word and get all this information. The killer app of Web1 was democratizing knowledge. There's a great quote that today somebody has in their pocket more information than the president of the United States had 20 years ago. It's an amazing thing. But it was read-only in the sense of you could go type something and you could consume it. Web2 was read-write, meaning not only consuming information, but also publishing information. With Web2, you democratized publishing. And that was services like Twitter and Facebook. You could go in and type some words and suddenly anyone in the world could see it. It manifests itself in many ways. There was text-based things like Facebook and Twitter, at least Facebook initially. And then YouTube, democratized video, fast forward, you have TikTok, Instagram, all these other kinds of things. Anyone can become a publisher. That was a great thing. It opened up things that were previously limited to a small set of people who had the ability to publish. And we now have something on the order of 5 billion people with smartphones who have instantaneous, mostly free access to tons of information, can communicate, talk to their family overseas. There's a lot of wonderful things. The one downside of it was in the first year of the web, the governing systems were open protocols. So if you built a website in the first year of the web, you were building on a protocol called HTTP, which is the protocol of the web. If you were sending email, you were building on SMTP, which is the protocol of email. The nice things about those systems is if you built up an email audience, and this is true to this day, you own that audience. No one can intermediate you. No one can step in and say, Apple takes 30% or Google and Facebook take 100% of the revenue. They can't step in and change that. They can't change the rules. They can't change the terms of service. You just have that relationship. That was really important economically. In the same way that you're more likely to invest in a country that has a predictable rule of law that you know if you build a business, you own that business, as opposed to, let's say, a dictatorship where they might seize your assets, the fact that you could build on these open protocols in Web1 encouraged tons and tons of investment, entrepreneurship, et cetera. So the one downside with Web2 was that basically the Web1 protocols couldn't keep up in terms of the functionality people wanted. They wanted to have a simple name and a follow graph and all these other kinds of advanced features that Web2 offered. These companies stepped in. They provided that service. And at first, I think that was a good thing. But in tech, the way that you accrue power is through network effects. The effect of when you build a network, the more users you have, the more valuable it gets. Basically, in Web2, the network effects accrued to a set of companies. That has led to an extreme consolidation of power and money on the internet today. You have five, maybe 10 companies that essentially control the internet. You still have open protocols like the web and email, but they've been diminished in their influence and power. So what Web3 is, is a new movement that involves new technology, including blockchains and tokens. We call it read, write, own. You get the reading ability of Web1, the writing ability, the democratizing of publishing of Web2. But then you also have this new ability for the users and the developers and the creative people who build these networks to actually own the network, to control the networks, and to have the upside of the economics of those networks. You had these early examples of systems like Ethereum. Think of Ethereum as a global computer. Anyone can access it. Anyone can write code for it. The code that you write has different properties that previous computers didn't have. It's really just owned by a community. There are some people that help create it, but they don't own it anymore. They don't control it. What we're seeing now and what we're investing in is a whole new wave of services, including social networks, marketplaces, all the things you've seen in the previous eras of the web. But this time, instead of being owned by a company, they're owned by a community. The goal of Web3 is to get the best of both worlds, to get the democratized open protocols of Web1 and the advanced functionality that we've come to love, mobile apps, fast user experience, everything else from Web2, and combine those. It's accelerated in the last year. I'm a venture capitalist. I invest in entrepreneurs. I don't actually build products. I invest in people to build products. And so we depend on having great entrepreneurs enter the space. And one of the really exciting things for me is that it's been this really big wave of new talent entering the space. When I talk to friends who aren't even into crypto and Web3, technology investors, they'll tell me something on the order of 50% or more of the entrepreneurs that come to them are doing Web3. So it's really hitting critical mass and scale. And it's a really exciting time. You mentioned in this consolidation of power in Web2, the power of the network effects. As these protocols, these projects get built into Web3, how do you think about the stickiness of those existing network effects in how difficult it might be to create new networks in Web3? 
new technology trends don't come in a vacuum. You have a lot of incumbent power and other kinds of forces, which makes it complex. And you just take something like Twitter. So I've been on Twitter, I think, 15 years and built up a pretty big audience. And I can't leave Twitter. If I leave Twitter, I lose my audience. I can't go and switch off. In the way that, for example, with email, if I don't like Substack or I don't like some other email service provider, I can take my list with me. I can take my followers with me. If I don't like my web hosting provider, I can switch web hosting providers just by switching my DNS name. And I take all of my inbound links and Google SEO and everything else with me. With Twitter, I can't. And so you're right. It's very sticky. A couple of things here. One is there's a venture phrase, greenfield, brownfield. Greenfield means you're going after a new market. Brownfield, you're going after an existing market. Probably a lot of the opportunity will be in greenfield. So there'll be a whole new set of networks that haven't been created before, which now we have a choice. It's a new way to create them. We can create them in the Web 2 way or the Web 3 way. That's probably the most fertile ground for the Web 3 opportunity. Instead of trying to recreate the last set of networks, there'll be a new set of networks. What's the point of the internet? Why do we as humans (laughs) care about the internet? For the most part, what matters on the internet are networks. You look at your phone and you look at the apps you use, the vast majority of them, whether they're social networks, payment networks, marketplaces like eBay and Amazon, they're networks. They connect various people, disparate parties that otherwise might not connect, dating networks, whatever it might be. The point of the internet is networks. I think of it as we probably have 20, maybe 100, if you count smaller ones, scaled networks on the internet. There should be many, many more. There should be thousands of networks. Now that we have a new technique for creating these networks, all that said, we're still going to try our best and make investments in people taking on the incumbents. They have a lot of really big weaknesses. And specifically, the big weakness of the social media incumbents is on the creator side. I was talking to someone last night at an event who's a YouTuber, and they said they got a million views and they made $17. And YouTube, by the way, is the most generous. Twitter and Facebook have $0 revenue share. And Instagram is $0. So Instagram makes all their money on advertising. They pay zero out to the creators. This is a very good trick they pulled off. I think it was a bit of a bait and switch. If you talk to a lot of creators, the very common experience is they'll go on, they'll create an organic reach, meaning they'll get free users, people following them. The intermediaries will throttle their organic reach deliberately and make them pay to get back to that same reach. That's 80% of the, quote, machine learning people at Google and Facebook. This is what they do. They go and they play games and throttle and basically try to extract all the money from the creative people. I think that's the soft underbelly of these companies is that they have been so extractive. They don't create content. They depend on content creators and they depend on content creators who I think they've mistreated. I think they're vulnerable. We're going to create a new set of social networks. We've invested in a bunch just recently where instead of the creators getting 0%, they get 98%. And we think that those can still be great businesses with a very small take rate because they can be very big. They don't have to have nearly as many people writing machine learning algorithms to extract money and doing all these kinds of tricks that these companies do. I do think that Greenfield, Brownfield is a good framework, that there will be new things. And look, Excel and Word are still very popular products after 40 years. People still use Oracle databases. They're still big companies, and there's a lot of momentum in technology. There's a lot of stickiness. I'm not under any illusion that Google and Facebook are going away. I think they're very likely going to become like IBM and HP and just chugging along and not really doing much new innovative stuff. They'll still be around and they'll still have their services, but I think that their relevance and growth are limited. They appear to be missing these new trends. Assuming they continue to do that, I expect that will happen. As a venture capitalist in the space, Web3, where you're broadly sharing the economics with the creators or with the people that are using developing protocols, depending on the space, how do you think about your return profile as an investor, knowing that you're not trying to extract all the economics the way that the Web2 companies have? The dream was always in Web2, it didn't happen, is that you'd have these capital asset light businesses. Think of Craigslist or something. I don't know how many employees they have, but it's not many. And they have massive profit margins. As far as I know, Craigslist only monetizes a few categories. So they effectively have a very low take rate. They could run it very differently. If they were run by a traditional Silicon Valley management team, they'd be taking money at every category. They'd be growing the team. They'd have machine learning teams. They'd have all these other kinds of things. They don't do it that way. And it's quite good. It's a super high margin business. It's a different model. Like if you just go look at S1s of these tech companies, the vast majority, whether they're consumer or enterprise, probably spending more on sales and marketing than their total revenue. In blockchain Web3, there's been very, very few cases of people spending significant money on customer acquisition. One of the exciting things with Web3 is that the users, because they have tokens, because they have ownership, they become evangelists for these systems. Generally, tech markets can be very big and probably will continue to get bigger. Just going back to the 2000s, if you told even the most bullish people that Facebook would be as big as it is today, I think they would think you were crazy. 
I just have a fundamental faith that tech markets can be very big. And two, I think there's a different model to run, which is a much lighter OPEX model with much lower sales and marketing costs, much lower headcount, passing those savings back to the users through a lower take rate. So you've just gone through a very significant fundraise for your next fund in the space. I'm curious in that process, what you saw in terms of investor adoption. We have a set of our own investors that invest in us. For a lot of them, we've had a long-time relationship. We have a separate crypto fund now. We're on a fourth crypto fund, but many of them we've been working with for long before that. We've been very clear that we're doing venture capital. I think in crypto, if you go watch CNBC and things, I think they often treat it as if it's a later stage category. I think that's a mistake. I think it's an early stage category, long time horizon. Our funds are 10 to 15 year funds. When we raised our first crypto fund, I actually personally went out and met with every single LP, 60, 70 meetings or something. Part of what I did was explain how it's different and risky and why they might not want to invest. And some of them opted out. So we went very deliberately, got a subset of investors who really believed. And those investors have been great. They've been super loyal and they've continued to support us. We've done what we said we were going to do, I hope. They understand this is a long-term emerging tech category and they've been very supportive and very patient. So how about beyond your investor base? What are you seeing in terms of retail and institutional adoption of everything from Bitcoin to different protocols and projects? That's like a theme, especially among the Bitcoiners, which I'm not really part of that community. There's a lot of talk about we need to get institutions to adopt. I don't really think about that much. I think of it as we need to build great products used by billions of people. And then I just assume the institutions will follow. The institutions are going to go where the growth and the money is, frankly. That's what comes first. So I feel like people are putting the cart before the horse when they talk about institutional adoption at this point. I'm not sure institutions should be adopting like venture capitalists, entrepreneurs, but to me, it's very much in that realm. Like Web2 was in the 2000s, didn't really see a role at that point for a big bank or something. I think they should come in later when these are later stage companies and need more advanced financial engineering and other kinds of things that those institutions provide. How do you think about the scale of what you now have to put to work in the space and the opportunities you're seeing? We just raised a $4.5 billion new fund. The crypto market has dropped in half basically in the last few weeks, but it's worth about a trillion dollars. When I started the crypto fund and decided to spend my life on it, what I believed was that there were going to be 10 plus really important crypto projects that would be at the scale of tech incumbents or something like this, that kind of broad scale. We're very much in the elephant hunting business, not in the rabbit hunting business. Generally, what we own, contrary to Jack Dorsey and others saying that we own Web3, we generally own sub 5% of most of these networks. But my model, if we can do that and get some of the big ones, that we can get a very good return on even a big fund. I'd love to talk about some of the themes you're looking at over the next couple of years. You touched on decentralized social media and effectively creator monetization. What are the particular areas within that that you've gotten excited about? So I'll give a couple of examples on the creator monetization side. Music's a very interesting category of a couple of investments there, Sound XYZ, Royal. Music's very interesting because if you look at all the different creative categories, music, gaming, podcasting, writing, a whole bunch of other categories. Music's one where the enthusiasm of the audiences is very high. People love music. People feel a strong affinity for musicians. They feel a real sense of community among people that are fans, especially emerging bands and things like this. On the flip side, music is very badly monetized, at least on the internet, for most musicians. Like A lot of them will tell you they make most of their money touring with merchandise. And they make most of their money that way because that's where there's fewer intermediaries, right? They can sell a t-shirt directly. Online, they have to go through internet streaming providers and labels and all these layers that take so much of the money. With things like NFTs, a bunch of these music companies are letting musicians monetize directly with their audiences by selling digital collectibles, digital album art, proof of fandom, backstage access. It's just a set of new tools for them to go directly to their audience. They're early, but a lot of these numbers are really impressive. We're investors in OpenSea, which is an NFT platform. We put a report out recently where we calculated how much OpenSea had paid out to creative people. And it was something on the order of $5 billion last year with a B, which compares to, I think, YouTube paid out a total of $20 billion. And of course, as I mentioned, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, zero. I believe we'll see in the next couple of years, Web3 payouts pass Web2 payouts. That's one example. There's a lot of really interesting possibilities on the social media side to create new protocols. So if you remember RSS, RSS was probably the most credible open protocol competitor to Twitter and Facebook. Go back to like 2008. At the time, it had equal market share. People using RSS as a way to publish and read and consume. 
it lost. It's diminished significantly in its market share. I think a lot of that was due to not having the same kind of functionality that people wanted. So for example, on Twitter, you could just go and I sign up and I'm C. Dixon and I can follow you and boom, I'm done. RSS, you had to go buy a domain name for $8 and set it up. And it was much more of like a wonky developer experience. A few of our recent investments are creating this next-gen RSS. They don't call it that, but let's think of it that way where you simulate the same functionality of something like Twitter. And one of the really exciting things that for those who remember, when Twitter first came out, there was this huge developer ecosystem, people building different clients, people building services around it. It was probably the main area of venture capital focus around 2009 or 10 or something of people investing in the Twitter ecosystem. Twitter decided to shut that down because they decided to pursue an advertising business model, which I think was a mistake, but that's what they did. And they shut down that whole vibrant ecosystem. I think one of the opportunities we're going to see the next year or two is people recreating those open protocol kind of services, really harnessing that developer enthusiasm. There's really two ways tech products get popular. One analogy I like to use is Wikipedia. So Wikipedia came out, I think it was 2001. At the time, there were very popular alternative encyclopedias. So I think the most popular was Encarta, which was created by Microsoft. And if you went to Encarta, you looked up a giraffe, you'd see a beautiful picture of a giraffe and maybe something written by a giraffe scholar. And it's all very proper and thoughtful. And you went to Wikipedia and it was a shit show of people arguing and fighting and everything else. But what Wikipedia did was that they got this hardcore, enthusiastic core contributor set. And if you look at the numbers, around 2003, 4, the quality started getting better and better. It started sort of hockey sticking, exponential growth in terms of users and contributors. Fast forward, I think Encarta shut down 2007. Today, Wikipedia, I think everyone agrees, is an incredible resource. A couple of interesting points there. Wikipedia really only has something on the order of 20,000 people. You don't need that many. Now, of course, 20,000 people, how many people did Encarta have? They probably had a couple hundred or something. I don't know what a typical encyclopedia company has. So even if you just get what's a small number on the internet, like 20,000, you can have one of the de facto biggest companies in the world. That shows the power of that. Open source software is still an undertold story in the world. 99% of the software that your listeners are interacting with on a daily basis is open source software. Open source software was a radical left-wing political movement in the 80s, Richard Stallman at MIT. It then morphed, and a lot of people dismissed it in the same way they dismissed crypto today. It morphed into a technology movement in the 90s with Linux and service systems like that. And then in the 2000s really grew. And today it's 99% of the software. Most of the software on your iPhone, almost all the software on your Android, all backend software is open source software. The same kind of thing. It's this power of the crowd. It's the power of the community. And so one of the things I'm really excited about with Web3 social networks is being able to tap into that crowd energy, the crowd of developers, the crowd of creators. And I think we're going to have a really interesting time now in the next couple of years. You know, I've been talking about these ideas forever, but one thing I'm really excited about is now we finally have great entrepreneurs pursuing it. And I think we're going to see some real results. In both those examples, music, tokenization, and ways of paying creators, and then the decentralized social media, you can imagine both of those being at some point in time a natural monopoly or a natural oligopoly, where on the music side, whoever figures out how to deliver this to creators the best way should be the ecosystem that derives most of the creators, most of the talent. They can move easily. Both from a venture capital perspective and then an ecosystem perspective, there's the concept of decentralization, but then there's also power that gets ultimately concentrated, like any industry, in the hands of a few networks. Curious how you think about that, like in the end game. Power in tech is network effects, almost always. Occasionally you have scale effects, brand effects, but generally it's network effects. The key question is where do the network effects accrue? In Web1, you had big services around email and Hotmail. And the reason Hotmail never got that much power is they didn't accrue the network effects. You didn't get dependent on Hotmail. You could leave Hotmail. You could leave Hotmail and still be able to email people because they didn't control the network. The network was owned by a community. To me, that's the key distinction. In the case of Web3, the network is owned by the community. Yet, I think you'll have big services. We'll hopefully invest in some of them, but they won't have the dominant network effects that lock you in. And users will have a choice. Users can exit. Why do email providers or web hosting providers stay in check? Because you can exit. And you exit through DNS. I own cdixon.org. cdixon.org, I point it to an IP address. If that IP address is a service provider that I don't like, I can switch where I point it to. That gives me power. If I had that same ability on Twitter, I'd switch off of Twitter. I'd switch C. Dixon on Twitter to something else because I don't like how they run that service. They have spam and a bunch of other things. And I'd like to switch and take my followers with me, but I can't do it and I'm locked in. And so it's all about network effects. So my suggestion is when you make predictions about monopolies, you need to analyze where the network effects are accruing. And you basically have two choices with network effects. We can have them accrue to a company or we can have them accrue to the community. Those are the two ways we know how to build networks. Maybe there'll be a new way in the future. 
Those are the two ways we know it now. And to me, that's the critical question as to whether when you analyze, is something going to lead to a monopoly? What are some of the other themes you're excited about on the investing side? I would say first and foremost, one thing I've learned in venture capital, for better or worse, is it's fundamentally a talent business. Like we invest in people. And so someone will come in and have some new idea we never thought of in a category we never thought of, and we'll invest if they're great. I'll talk about themes, but I just want to mention that the first thing we'd like to do is throw out our themes and and invest in great people. In our practice, we break it into multiple categories. We have a very active infrastructure practice. The way I look at the history of computing, you have two layers of activity. You have the infrastructure layer and the application layer. Just to give you an example, let's take smartphones. I was sick for a week and I was watching old movies, Lethal Weapon, Mel Gibson. It was great. It was funny because they had these giant cell phones with these huge boxes they were carrying around. In the 90s, there were companies like General Magic. There's a documentary. It's really interesting about it. It's a company in, I think it was early 90s, that tried to create an iPhone, but they were too early. I had a lot of these devices. There was the Sidekick, the Trio, the Palm, the Windows Phone, the whole thing. And then finally, boom, 2007, the iPhone came along, Android, and that really accelerated the modern smartphone adoption. But you had this whole period where the infrastructure was getting better and better. And then finally, you get to a point where it gets good enough. You've created the right abstraction layer where the developers no longer have to understand how the infrastructure works. So almost all of the big mobile apps were created between 2009 and 11. 2007, you had the iPhone. 2008, then they released the App Store. It takes people about a year to figure it out. And then people could go build these services. So if you take something like Travis Kalanick building Uber, at that point, the infrastructure was good enough that he depended on GPS. Obviously, Uber does to locate the taxi and the rider. But he didn't have to understand how to build a GPS chip. He could focus on building a taxi service. The infrastructure had gotten good enough that you could really have modularity separation between the application and the infrastructure layer. I think we're close to that in blockchains and crypto, but we're not quite there yet. So we're making a lot of investments in the infrastructure layer to get to that point. There's obviously financial and entrepreneurial opportunity in that. I also think it's important for bringing the space forward. On the infrastructure layer, one of the things I've heard repeatedly is the importance of composability across the various protocol layers. We'd love to hear how you think about that and how you go about investing in it. So composability, it's a very important concept. Going back to my discussion of open source earlier, I think you can't really understand the history of technology if you don't understand why open source became so dominant. I think a lot of people that talk about technology don't talk about this story, and I think they're missing a huge component. Open source is so dominant because you only need to create each thing once. So when you go on GitHub and you create a piece of code, that code can be reused by anybody. Instead of how proprietary software works, you build a widget and you got to keep building more and more stuff and rebuilding the same thing over and over. The beautiful thing with open source software, it's like Lego bricks. Someone builds one Lego brick, someone builds another, someone else comes along and combines them. I like to say composability is to software as compounding interest is to finance. It has that same amazing thing when you do compounded interest. You're like, whoa, that really matters a lot. This is obviously well known to your listeners. But in software, that's kind of the thing that gives you that same effect. Composability has long time been recognized in the open source software world as the key factor by which open source software can move so quickly as compared to proprietary software. So one of the interesting things that blockchains introduce is composability, not just at the software code layer, but at the service layer, meaning you have running software. So you can have a service like, as an example, Compound, which we're investors in. It's a lending protocol built on Ethereum that has tens of billions of dollars managed by the protocol. This is a very interesting new idea where the money does not sit with a company or in a bank account. It literally sits in the code. This is one of the new kind of capabilities of a blockchain. And Compound, by the way, contrary to a lot of the news you'll read today, Compound and all of the other on-chain DeFi protocols have performed quite well in this volatile market. One thing interesting about Compound is it's a service in and of itself, but it's also a Lego brick. We have another investment called Goldfinch, which builds on top of Compound. And what they do is Compound is only on-chain. Goldfinch go to developing countries and other places where there's a need for capital, and they borrow from these protocols and then build other services on top, which bridge these services from the digital to the offline world. And that's very powerful because they don't have to go rebuild that first piece. And so you're not reinventing the wheel, and that gives you this accelerated effect. We've seen a bunch of interesting examples of this. I think that over the next couple of years, people are really starting to understand how to do this and developers are really adopting it. And I hope we see accelerated examples of composability. I'd love to go through a couple of those app layer categories and just see what's exciting you. What else in DeFi is getting you excited? DeFi is really interesting. We've been involved for a while. We invested four or five years ago in MakerDAO, which I consider one of the original DeFi protocols. And then Compound, as I mentioned, Uniswap, which is what's called a decentralized exchange, just passed a trillion dollars in trading volume, quite popular. 
a lot of those came out two or three years ago. And there's been some interesting stuff since, but I think somewhat of a lull in DeFi. A lot of these things run on what's called layer one Ethereum, where you have high transaction costs. One of the interesting things happening now in blockchains is that we're seeing production ready, scaled other networks, including what are called layer two networks on top of Ethereum that are really ready for prime time. And that dramatically lowers the transaction costs and therefore opens up a lot of new design possibilities. When you have high transaction costs, as you did previously in Ethereum layer one, you had applications like lending where you maybe borrow a million dollars, you don't mind paying hundred dollars plus for the transaction. By lowering the transaction costs, I think you're going to see a lot more new designs. So it's an area we spend time on and we're actively looking at. We made a few investments, seed investments in smart teams recently. I expect we'll make more, but I do think it goes in waves and right now waiting for the next wave. As we're going through this tumultuous time in the whole ecosystem, how do you think about in the area of DeFi, the embedded leverage in the system? So we should distinguish DeFi from quasi-crypto DeFi. I mean, there's these companies now in the news that are not DeFi, they're not on-chain, that are involved in lending and things, which according to news reports have been in trouble. Everything on-chain, all the DeFi stuff that we're investors in, it's all open source, open data. You can go analyze it. It's all just there. So we can see it all. All of those things are fine. We'll see things could change, but by all metrics and reports, these other companies are very opaque. I don't think we have really any insight to them. I don't know where that will go, and maybe it will get worse before it gets better. You have some hedge funds now that maybe are in trouble and maybe have leverage. Maybe we can just allude to regulation. Contrary to some reports, we have been advocating for regulation in the space. Specifically, I'll just take stablecoins as an example. That's been in the news. Some of these non-collateralized stablecoins blew up. It's a very important distinction between collateralized and uncollateralized stablecoins. For example, USDC is a stablecoin that's co-sponsored by Coinbase and Circle that is fully collateralized. So if you have a dollar of USDC, there's literally a dollar sitting in a bank. It's audited. It's regulated. Maybe the regulations can be improved. And then you have uncollateralized. Terra Luna was this prominent thing that fell apart. And there you didn't have a dollar in the bank. That should be regulated. I think people making claims to consumers that can't be backed up, that's the point of financial regulations. Quite frankly, for us, it's been frustrating because we're not involved in the uncollateralized ones. USDC gets all the attention from the regulators and the other ones are ignored. And it creates this perverse incentive where it actually, I think, incentivizes people to be offshore, more aggressive because they don't get the scrutiny. And the people that want to operate in the US and play by the rules do. And I think it's been exactly the wrong way to think about this. What's happened in the gaming area? Axie Infinity had a big growth adoption and then a contraction. What are you seeing today in gaming? They have a new game that's doing really well. As with most of the press stuff around this, it's overly dramatic and quite negative, and I don't think very accurate. We have a separate games fund at our firm that's not crypto. We just launched it about a month or two ago. But I've had a games practice for a while, which is separately, by the way, an interesting story because I think the games industry is changing and we're trying to be part of that. That games team has no specific focus on Web3 and crypto. There's like a set of great gaming talent companies out there, Blizzard, Riot, Epic, Valve, Supercell. And what will happen is maybe not the most senior people, but the next most senior people will sometimes leave and decide they want to strike out on their own and create a studio and come to firms like us. And that's kind of what our games fund does is they invest in these really talented top end game developers, people that have created world class games. Those game developers, I would say the majority of them are now doing NFT Web3 gaming. We've probably made 15 investments in what I would call world-class game developers. This idea that Web3 gaming, you pay people to play, I think that's a very early version of what's going on. I think what's really going on is that in modern gaming, if you look at games like Fortnite, League of Legends, they make their money through virtual goods and they have many economies in these games. The most extreme example is something like EVE Online, where it's truly this big, really fascinating economy. And the idea, in my mind, in Web3 Gaming is today, in these economies, you can't take your money out. You're kind of locked into the game. And all of the profits go to the corporation that sponsored the game. So imagine instead an economy that's much more fluid, where you can take your money out, and where the company takes a tax. I think in Axie, it's 5%. But the goal of the game will be to create this giant economy and grow that economy and let it permeate the internet and interoperate with other games and be part of this fabric of this larger, quote, metaverse take a tax on it. They're for-profit companies, but the tax doesn't need to be 100%. And that's where it is today. I think the current designs are very limited in how they think about it. They're much richer designs where the users can benefit and can have this fabric of games interoperating as the internet becomes more and more important. If 20 years ago, you told people that people were making a living, making videos online and tweeting, it would sound crazy. I think that trend will only increase and there'll be more and more people who earn a living digitally. And I think 
creating spaceships and EVE Online and selling goods and creating worlds and doing all sorts of other creative activities, for example, in a gaming universe will be a really interesting source of income for a lot of people in the future. At the programming level, the concept of being able to take whatever virtual goods you have and move them from one game to the other isn't actually that hard to understand. How difficult and how far away is that from being able to be programmed so that, as you said, someone who doesn't understand what the technology is can just seamlessly play these games and move around their virtual goods? I think it's less of a programming. I think the programming is there today. NFTs are a pretty simple programming standard that's relatively easy to bring from one game to another. I think a lot of it is more questions that need to be worked out on the design side and the standard side. So if I have an elven magical sword in one game, what does it mean to take it to another game? How does it behave? Are the attributes the same? Are the visuals the same? What are the incentives for the user to do that? What are the incentives for the games to interoperate like that? Those are the more interesting questions. And I think there's two ways to look at that. One is, wow, this is hard and we haven't figured it out. The other is opportunity shows up wearing overalls. It's a really exciting thing to figure out. That's where the most creative games people are self-filtering into this. And they're saying, wow, this is fun. I don't want to create another cut the rope, the 18,000th puzzle game on the iPhone. I want to invent new design patterns. It's the frontier. So the opposite of backing some of these great creatives, as you mentioned, the notion of decentralized content and story creation. What's happening in that area? Yeah, we've made a couple of investments there. I'm very excited about this. There's a blog post on our website created by a friend of ours called Fantasy Hollywood, which first inspired me. If you think about fan communities on the internet, websites like Wattpad with fan fiction, or you go on Reddit and you read Star Wars communities or Harry Potter communities, people are very, very passionate about these they create new stories, they argue, they vote on canons. The idea I find fascinating and I'm very excited about is imagine if the next Harry Potter was actually created by an internet community. And that internet community not only created it, but actually owned it, both economically and in terms of control. They could decide on the canon, they could fork the canon, they could create new characters. And they in some way participate in the economics of it. If it's very successful, if there's a movie license, whatever it might be, they get to participate in that. So to me, that is what I was talking about earlier, the development of the internet and things like Wikipedia. This to me takes it all to a next level. Wikipedia is fun and everything else, but they still have that banner every year begging for money. They have no economic engine. So what if you combine all of that enthusiasm and energy that people have already demonstrated for all of these various creative communities and combine it with an economic engine that rewards them? I've been spending time in LA. The media world, people in Hollywood in general, I think are very excited about Web3 for a couple of reasons. One, NFTs and selling emotion and digital objects. It's not at all strange to them in the way it is to Silicon Valley. People at Google and Facebook, in my experience, just don't get this stuff. Web2 entrepreneurs just scratching their heads and they say it's all scams and fraud. They just don't get it. People in Hollywood get it. It's not weird to them. They've been selling emotion and stories and everything else for 100 plus years. And number two, they don't like the current status quo. They don't like the intermediaries. They've suffered from it. And so the idea that you could create new things that go around those intermediaries is very exciting to them. So I think you'll see a lot more partnerships between the Web3 community and the media community. I think we're natural partners. And the idea of partnering with them and helping them bypass these gatekeepers is a really big opportunity. As you built this business at A16Z, the firm has this wonderful reputation for being a full service provider for portfolio companies, entrepreneurs. I'm curious how you adapted that to your crypto investing on your team and what you're providing to your investments. Before I joined, I joined in 2013. The firm started in 2009. And the major innovation of the firm, VCs had always promised to do more than provide capital, but they didn't really have the support system to actually deliver on that. They said, we're going to have a different model where we're going to take our money and our management fees and spend a lot of it on what we call our operating team, which sure teams that support our company. So that's always been the model of the firm. When we started the first crypto fund a few years ago, we had shared services with the rest of the firm and forked out the investment side. But what we found, though, was to your point that really the crypto Web3 entrepreneurs wanted different services. So we've actually now split things off. I mean, we're still formally part of the bigger firm and we have economic relationships. But from an operational point of view, we're a completely independent team. We have 80 people on the crypto team. 13 are on the investment team. Then there's some set of back office and support, and then 50 or so on our operating teams. Soon to have 10 people on our talent team. Talent is executive and engineering and design recruiting. And we do everything from sourcing to recruiting to placing 
This is just a hugely high demand thing in our portfolio. We have an engineering team that's contributing to open source projects that's helping our companies with coding problems. We have a six or seven person security team. That's a big topic in this space. So we have manual code auditing to find bugs. We're starting now a formal verification program. That's the thing to write software to go find security vulnerabilities. We have a 10 plus person marketing comms team that we're growing. We just launched our first Web3 podcast newsletter. We're going to do a whole lot more there. We started a research team. We hired this amazing guy, Tim Roughgarden, who's a professor of computer science at Columbia, who now is full-time with us, who's leading that effort, and just hired a whole bunch of other great professors. And we're going to be putting out research. All of that will be open source. We're trying to model it after the great research labs in the AI world, where they've pushed the field forward and published a lot of great work and done that in an open source way. We have a business development team. Much of it is demand-driven. We talk to entrepreneurs all the time and they say, hey, I need this, I need that. Can you help me? We don't try to replace what the entrepreneurs do. Great companies should build out their own capabilities, but we think there's a role for VCs to supplement that. We make a very heavy investment in those areas and I think it's very important. When we invest, we don't do quote unquote party rounds. We don't put a little bit of money here and dabble. We either invest and lead and back up the truck and put all our resources behind it and roll up our sleeves or we don't invest. That's our model. With both your team and say your talent team in helping your portfolio companies, I'm curious if the hiring practices in these types of projects are different in what you can look at for someone's talent and skill than they might have been in a traditional organization. I think so. There's some similarities and some differences. So for example, in our world, a lot of people may not have formal educations. They may not have the same pedigree, brand name, resumes. We've hired a lot of people who have not gone to college. What we want to see is they've demonstrated excellence. That excellence can be through open source code. It can be through other kinds of things they built, other achievements. Credentials are significantly less valued in the space. Crypto blockchain is global. It skews more technical. It's very mission focused. And we just had our offsite. What makes it so fun and why I find it so exciting is a team of true believers. And I think that's true in a lot of the people we recruit. I think they're really mission driven. If you're in tech now, what are the exciting new pioneers and missions you can pursue? This is in no way to diminish other categories, but I just don't think people feel mission driven with respect to SaaS software as an example or databases. I think those are important categories, just so you know, and our firm invests in them. They provide real value, but Web3 is probably unique right now in the tech world in that it feels like more than just a job. We really look for that as well. When you're backing entrepreneurs, you mentioned earlier the importance of you're really backing great people. Does the definition of what that means in a technical space in this mission-driven, decentralized way differ from what it might be, say, elsewhere in the types of entrepreneurs A16 is backing outside of the space? One of our core frameworks is invest in strengths, not lack of weaknesses. So what that means is look for people with some kind of superpower, but that doesn't mean they have to be well-rounded. The truth is a lot of great people and a lot of great companies have a lot of flaws. And if you go and look for things that are well-rounded and check all the boxes, I believe that's a path towards mediocre returns and mediocre hiring. So we try to really understand that. Core characteristics you look for in entrepreneurs are probably pretty universal. It's some really great strength, superpower, some kind of deep insight that might have led them to that startup, whether it's through their personal experience or technical experience or some other reason. And then a lot of it is grit. My mental model is basically every startup hits the quote unquote trough of disillusionment. I think that was a Paul Graham blog post. You start a company and you have this idea and everything's fun and you're having beers and splitting up the equity and talking about all the big visions you have. And then you get into the details of it. And almost always you hit this trough of disillusionment. And the trough of disillusionment is like, oh my God, I don't have product market fit. What was I thinking? This is a lot harder than I thought. You get through that trough. You have to have two characteristics. You have to really just be all in. You have to have grit and you have to be willing to put up with that and be kind of miserable. And all your friends say, what are you doing? And why are you wasting your time? And then the other thing you have to do is you have to have really deep and comprehensive domain knowledge because you've got to figure out how to get out of that trough. Usually the solution is not a business solution and not a technical solution. It's a comprehensive cross-disciplinary solution. And you have to have a founder who really sees that whole thing and understands it to get through that. There's no formula for predicting people will be able to get through that. I don't have the answer. I think I've gotten somewhat better at predicting it over the years. But that's another key characteristic you look for. That's a very important one. I'd love to turn a little bit to this market environment. We've talked in the past about the different crypto winters and the bull markets and what happens at different inflection points in market pricing, capital flow, technical development, and talent. Curious in this most recent sell-off, if you're seeing anything underneath that's changed in a material way. My read on this, you first had the high growth tech stocks fall. I saw today Netflix was down 70%. 
Crypto has obviously fallen. To me, this feels more like 2008 than the crypto downturns of 2014 and 18. A macro thing with inflation, interest rates, the next few months will tell. Maybe the inflation was transitory, or maybe it will lead to problems in real estate and credit markets. And my sense is this is a broad macro risk off mood and that crypto is caught up in it. And you're getting these domino effects where some of these firms are failing and things which are exacerbating it. I feel very strong and solid in all of our core thesis in the space and none of that's changed. And I don't see any wavering among the people we're involved with, whether it be at our firm or in the investments we have. And historically, I'm never happy to see a downturn and people get laid off and there's all sorts of bad things that happen. But for me, at least, these kinds of downturns have been generally the best investment periods and have also been, I think, very good from a entrepreneurial focus point of view. People aren't distracted with money and shiny objects and things and they're just building products. So I'm quite optimistic. Where has the underlying technical advancement, say, over the last year been most pronounced that someone who doesn't understand the technology wouldn't really appreciate? We now have a new wave of blockchains that I call Gen 4 blockchains that are coming out that I think are interesting. So for example, two interesting ones were spinouts of Facebook DM. So Facebook had spent a lot of money and resources building out blockchain infrastructure. They were not able to launch that for a variety of reasons, but the code they wrote was open source and a lot of the teams have left. What they did in that process was that they recruited a lot of great, what I would call classically trained computer scientists who have deep knowledge in relevant areas like distributed systems, cryptography, et cetera. Those folks had the benefit of being able to study the history of the space and looking at the strengths and weaknesses of various systems in the past. They are now striking out on their own and creating a next generation infrastructure. This is a very common pattern. You saw it with PCs as an example. So PCs started off with hackers and Steve Jobs and Wozniak were at the Homebrew Computer Club and it was a bunch of tinkerers. And they did a great job. And some of them make it to the promised land, by the way. When I say Gen 4, I think the Gen 3 and Gen 2 blockchains, a lot of them will upgrade and be very important in the future. There is also sometimes an advantage to starting later in the same way that you had Apple and the other tinkerers, but then you had Compaq and Dell and Microsoft and all these other people take the baton and run with it. I think you might see that here. If you look at just generally the history of technology, people mistakenly think of these things as laws of physics, like Moore's law. People talk about as if magically there's this inevitable march towards being able to pack more transistors on chips. I think in reality, a lot of these performance improvements are really economically driven. Once the iPhone hit product market fit and sold 100 million units, they could go and do all this amazing advancements in chips and optics and everything else. I think you're seeing the same effect here. I think now that we're seeing an economic model that's working, you're now seeing a lot of investment in the underlying infrastructure and you're getting this technology economic flywheel going. Is there anything in this particular downturn that concerns you differently than downturns of the past? The main thing I think about there is regulation. In the past, the space was too small. I think regulation is coming and I think we want to help have a discussion about it at least. What I would like to see is an outcome that regulates away the bad behavior while allowing the good behavior, the innovation I'm discussing on this podcast to continue as opposed to the two other states, which is underregulated now, which I don't think is good either, or overregulated to the point where a lot of this innovation moves offshore. We believe very strongly that this innovation should be in the United States. Most of our companies are domiciled in the United States. We always recommend that. We want them to pay taxes. I mentioned Uniswap. I'm in New York right now. They're down the street in Soho. They have an office here and they pay taxes. And we had these debates in the 90s over encryption and all these other kinds of internet policies. I think they landed in a pretty good place. Fast forward to today, I think that was a very wise decision because this has been a huge economic engine for the United States. We basically have two exports in the US right now. We have tech and media. Just look at the numbers. Those are the two killer products that we have. It's important that we continue that. This is the future. Web3 is the future of this. And it's very important that we find a balance that gets rid of the bad behavior. And I agree there's bad behavior. We want to get rid of that. It's not good for anybody, including the space, but also provides a path for entrepreneurs and innovators. So to me, that's probably the thing. It's gotten high profile enough that that's just inevitable. That's something I think about a lot. All right, Chris, I want to ask you a couple of questions before I let you go that I didn't get a chance to last year. What is your biggest investment pet peeve? When we invest, I think of it as a covenant between us and the entrepreneur. We're going to be there. We're going to roll up our sleeve. I take pride in the fact that we're very supportive as investors. So Coinbase, as an example, I was on the board and we invested in 2013, but they did 15 rounds of financing before they went public and we invested in every single one of them. Dapper Labs is a company that makes this popular product called Top Shot. But before Top Shot, they did, I think it was six rounds of financing and we invested in all of them. So we see ourselves as very loyal and we want that back from the entrepreneur. Our expectation, our hope is that there's a commitment both ways. We don't expect them to win or be successful, but we expect them to try really hard. A pet peeve would be entrepreneurs who just don't keep that covenant. Hey, I'm going to quit my startup and go take this cushy job. 
When we invest, that's kind of the only thing we expect. Certainly don't expect success. We just expect perseverance, I would say, and keeping that covenant. Which two people have had the biggest impact on your professional life? Maybe I'll be nostalgic for a second. I grew up in a small town in Ohio, and I got interested in computers. Dayton has an Air Force base. It turns out that's an Air Force intelligence base where they do a lot of computing stuff. And I didn't realize this at the time, but I was very lucky because there were these groups of people. This is in the 80s. My parents would drive me over to these school gyms every two weeks. And there were all these guys who were probably in like their 40s or 50s or whatever. And they had beards and mysterious jobs. And we would just sit around and talk about programming. We'd bring our computers. We'd show off our code. This is pre-real internet. And that was really formative for me. I don't remember the specific people, but I'm sort of lumping them together. What was so great about that too was it was a real community. PCs in the 80s were pretty niche before you really had the breakout of desktop publishing. And it was a real sense of camaraderie, like you're in this too. Everyone programmed. Basically what you did back then is you programmed or you played games. I was incredibly lucky to have that because that really got me interested in computers and gave me the sense of community. And by the way, it's one reason I love crypto today. I feel like it's a community too. You meet people that are into it and you really feel like this affinity. To me, a community is not when you look up to a leader like Steve Jobs. It's when you bump into somebody at a bar and they're interested in that topic and you actually feel an affinity. And that's how the PC felt back then. And that's how crypto feels today. I used to write letters. I wrote a letter to Apple. I basically said, look, I'm a 13-year-old and I have an Apple and I don't have any books on how to program. And I remember Alan Kay, who's a very famous computer scientist, literally wrote me a letter and sent me a giant box of books. That was the atmosphere back then. It was this really collaborative, small community and had this big influence on me. My whole career has been finding those communities that could be the PC back then, then moved to open source software and the internet. And I think blockchains and crypto have picked up that cult-like community feel today. How about one more recently? I used to be an entrepreneur in the 2000s. I had a lot of entrepreneurs who helped me out. Someone like Ron Conway, for example, influential angel investor. He was just so great because I started my first company in 2004. And it was a consumer internet company, which was just really not a popular thing. It was very hard to raise money. I just met him and then he introduced me to a bunch of relevant experts. And I think they all said negative things that he still invested. (laughs) And he helped me and he opened up this whole community and introduced me to people in Silicon Valley and just so supportive and helpful and didn't have any reason to be that I could tell. People at the firm, Mark and Ben, I joined the firm in 2013 and I think they had a billion dollar fund, which at the time was a big deal. People saw it as too big. The venture world, 2013, it was sort of happening, but it wasn't anything like it was today in terms of scale. And I came in and I said, I want to do really cutting edge stuff like crypto, drones, AI, virtual reality. And I want to do it aggressively and invest a lot of money. And I came in guns blazing. Some worked out, some didn't, including things like I led our investment in Oculus, which was a large check and a hardware company. And one or two other firms on earth at the time would have both the financial resources and the will to do that kind of investing. That kicked off a lot of stuff I did later on. And that was important. As with anyone with a fairly long career, I had a ton of people that helped me along the way and gave me breaks, and I was very lucky. All right, Chris, last one. What's the biggest mistake you've made, and what did you learn from it? Generally, people who might be listening to this, who are interested in technology, if you have tech skills and you're in this world, they dramatically overestimate the risk of starting a company. And you'll see a lot of people who... You know, I finished Stanford computer science and now I'm going to go work at Facebook for four years and now I'm going to do this. I wrote a blog post years ago called Climbing the Wrong Hill. The idea was then you get stuck on it where you're at Facebook. There's always some carrot, some next step, you get the promotion. And it's very easy to get trapped on kind of a local optimum, as you say, and CS, like the wrong hill. And it's very hard because at some point too, especially as you get further in your career, you have to take a step back to try a different hill. You probably have to take a pay cut and lower title and everything else. When in fact, I think the optimal strategy, especially early in your career, is to experiment. It's to try different hills, to try one, to try another, to optimize for learning, to optimize for meeting great people. You are the sum of the people around you. You become some kind of amalgamation of the people around you. And I did this myself in my 20s. That's advice I would give is don't wait. A very simple heuristic is people will come to me, can you give me some career advice? I'm like, great, well, what do you want to do in 10 years? I want to be a founder. What are you doing now? I'm at McKinsey. How does McKinsey get you there? Well, I'll get two more years of training. No, no, no. Like, Just go do it. And maybe you fail the first time. But if you do it right, if you fail right and you surround yourself with the right people, you can often get another shot. Chris, always super interesting. Thanks so much for taking the time. All right. Thanks, Ted. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com, 
where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one, and see you next time.